sisters and brothers, good evening. Good evening. And welcome to this meeting on Syria. I'm Lydia from Workers World Party, one of the co-sponsoring organizations for this meeting. First of all, I would really like to extend my solidarity to the Syrian people all over the world who are suffering from the devastation of war and the U.S. imposed economic sanctions, as well as thousands of refugees who have been displaced. You know, in this last few weeks, there has been an increase of news coverage about <coughs> Syria, both by the print and TV media, particularly in the city of Aleppo, Syria. And the narrative is, which is being pushed in the United States is that we should get, the U.S. should get more involved in the war <coughs> to prevent, quote, humanitarian catastrophe, unquote. I think it's very important to counter this media argument because their aim is to justify U.S military presence in Syria, U.S. troops, sisters and brothers, U.S. troops, whether on the ground or the bombing from the air, will not make it safer for the Syrian civilians. Judy Bellow's presentation will surely give us a better understanding about Syria <coughs> that is often hidden for the U.S. public. Judy Bellows joined a U.S. Peace Council fact-finding peace delegation in Syria this past July. It was her second delegation to Syria as she was in Damascus of June of 2014 as an election observer. This summer, Judy's delegation met with people from many walks of life, business people, government workers, NGO workers, clerics, and high-level officials. Judy is a member of the Rochester Peace Action and Education, a member of the United National Anti-War Coalition Administrative Committee, and a founding member of the Upstate Drone Action. <coughs> Excuse me and a longtime advocate for peace and justice. She has participated in the peace delegation to Iran, Iraq, and Pakistan, as well as Syria. So please give her a good hand. Should I use this one? Yes. Well, I think yes. <coughs> okay, I'm just trying to figure it out here. Um, okay, this is good for me too, so I can hear that I'm not actually using the mic. So thank you. And um, I just wanted to uh, say that, in, in a little briefly before I begin, that I hope my slideshow matches up with my notes, but I'm going to do my best. Um, it's not a fancy one this time. I didn't. I spend most of my time talking to people. And then I felt kind of silly, like saying, well, I need to take your picture. And there would be like 10 people handing cameras around. And I, again, I felt kind of ridiculous, like being yet another one. It, was, it seemed like a waste of time. And I probably was wrong about that. But <laughs> that was how it felt at the time, kind of depersonalizing. So, um, but at any rate, so um, I met with the Syri a lot of different people in the government-held area of Syria. We almost never in this country hear about what's happening in the government-held area of Syria. We hear about Assad, the demon, but we do not hear about the 20, uh, the uh, 20 million or 17 million people that are still in the government-held area of Syria. The majority of refugees that have fled Syria are in the government-held area, and they are like two-thirds. So. Two to one for the people that fled the country are actually in the government areas being looked after by the government to some degree or other. And nobody 
hears their voices. When they say Aleppo in the United States news, they're referring to 200,000 people living in a small area of Aleppo, uh, many of them hostages, most likely, of uh, the uh, aggressive forces of the opposition. And uh, they, this area is uh, sort of blocked off in a lot of ways. We'll get to that later. But what they don't tell you is that there's 1.5 million people living in the government held side of Aleppo. And the people on the boundaries have just as many civilian casualties as the ones in the opposition held area with far less people there to begin with. So we need to understand, are you trying to help me with this? Thank you, I don't know how to use these things. That's okay, it's just that it's a hot mic so you can't get too close. Oh, I'm too close to it? Oh, is that better? Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Oh, thank you. I can't tell. Um, so, uh, so anyway, I'm here tonight to speak for those like 17, 18 million people who are living uh, in Syria, their homeland. Uh, I guess maybe five, six million of them are displaced from their homes, but they're still in their homeland. They're still. Um, rely on their government to do what governments do, and that is to provide services for the people. And, they, uh, and their voices have been silenced in the West. So um, the other thing is that, uh, so I'm gonna just go through some background. That's the first piece of background. And uh, let's see how this is going. I started out with these romantic pictures. This is um, <coughs> the, uh, um, Jumi Mosque in uh, Damascus. Uh, St. Joseph is buried there. It's a very, very old site. It was a temple of Zeus uh, initially. And then it was a Christian church. And then it was a church and a mosque. And now it's a mosque and there's a beautiful new church beside it. <coughs> uh, this is what a lot of Damascus, and I might add a local <coughs> as well, look like. They are modern 21st century cities with roads full of cars, bustling business, office buildings, people living in homes of different economic stature, and along the boundaries of both cities, people who are less well off are living in areas that are regularly bombed from the uh, opposition occupied areas. Um, <coughs> So um, I just wanted to say one more thing about our trip while I'm here, which is that the, uh, it was our idea. The Syrian government didn't say, let's find some Americans to speak for us. We, uh, uh, the UNIC, uh, the uh, US Peace Council went to uh, the Syrian ambassador at the United Nations and they arranged this trip at great length. It took like a year. Uh, they, we, made all kinds of requests of people we'd like to talk to, didn't know who we'd actually get to see. Uh, and uh, we paid our own way there. We paid for our own hotel rooms, except for like a couple of days. And uh, so this was really something that was not like uh, imposed on uh, the American consciousness, but rather uh, a group of Americans who wanted to know the rest of the story. Um, so, um, I just a few points about the government. Uh, they've had a multi-party system in their parliament since 2012, right after the insurgency began. Um, any of the opposition parties that were willing to lay down their weapons were able to run for office and did indeed join the Syrian government. Uh, the second most important person in the Syrian government, and I will keep coming back to him because I was very impressed by him, is uh, a man named Ali Haydar. He's the Minister of Reconciliation. Um, he's known Bashar Assad for a really long time, but um, that's not necessarily why he's there. He's the head of the second largest socialist party in Syria, a party that's older, if you can believe it, than the Ba'ath Party. And uh, it's called the Syrian Social National Party. 
so um, I'll come back to all these points, but this is just a background. But they now have a, a mixed parliament. <coughs> Syria has an uh, incredible uh, amount of different ethnicities and religious uh, factions living there. Uh, they have numerous splinter groups in Christianity and Islam because they are right in the area where those two religions were born. And uh, Dam uh, Damascus was the second center of the Islamic Empire, first one being in uh, Mecca. Um, and it's also only a short distance from the birthplace of Jesus Christ. That entire region is full of little uh, different religious groups, and they have been living together in peace for uh, you know, 2,000 years if we go back to the beginning of Christianity when the Jews and Christians were pretty much living together in peace there. This is not, and the Romans were there, and there's just so many, many different uh, groups, and uh, secularism is not, or secularism is, goes naturally with Syrian culture, and sectarianism is not a natural thing in the Syrian culture. Uh, I want to talk a little about uh, who we met with relation to uh, religion. We met the Grand Mufti Ahmad Badreddin Hassoun. These are the things. This is just from the election. This is um, actually a refugee camp uh, in 2014. Uh, as I said, my slideshow is a little out of whack with everything else. And uh, so I just talked about Ali Haydar. And um, here are some members of the parliament. And uh, Syria is a total mix in terms of, like, say, women's dress. Everywhere you go, you see some women wear head coverings, some don't. Some people wear black all the time. Other people are dressed like this woman in the parliament. Uh, it's like that all over Syria. It's like that in the uh, university, everywhere that I travel. Um, they, uh, the Grand Mufti, and you say, what is that? Well, he is the highest Sunni uh, official in uh, Syria. He is a, uh, and, and in fact, the U.S. at one time blamed him for uh, having sending suicide bombers, but the fact is the guy's a progressive, and anyone <coughs> who talks to him can see that in the ideas he has. He talks about um, how all 23 million Syrians are his people and how he does not differentiate Sunni from Shia or Christian from Sunni in terms of his love for the people that are in his care. Um, we also uh, went to, uh, we also met with the Orthodox Bishop, Bishop Lucas. He's at the highest bishop there. But uh, we spent quite a bit of time with him because he took us to visit some Christian towns, uh, one of which is called Malula. And in Malula, there is a 1,500-year-old uh, shrine slash monastery, a Christian uh, space, that was that um, some of the um, U.S.-supported moderate rebels attempted to destroy. And uh, there's all kinds of icons and things there and very... Uh, states of disorder. Uh, there's piles of rubble. It's one of those things that's on a mountaintop and there's stairs and stairs and more stairs. There's piles of rubble on the stairs. And if you look up, you see the blue sky through like a like an opening, almost like it's part of the building. Uh, it's really quite amazing. Um, so um, the opposition forces, on the other hand, uh, are largely uh, at least controlled by, if not uh, every man to the one, Salafist groups, who want a right-wing Sunni government that doesn't tolerate diversity, that would drive the Christians out, kill uh, the Druze and Alawites and the other splinter sects of Islam that are there. Um, they've attacked the Kurds repeatedly. The Kurds actually fought with the government for a long time. Uh, until the United States kind of got their attention by offering them, making offers to them. Uh, and then they took the U.S. backing. Uh, Syria, we're told, here is the Grand Mufti and Bishop Lucas. <coughs> and um, as you can see, they're very friendly. Uh, Mr. Uh, 
Mufti Hassoun is, uh, I call him Sheikh Hassoun actually. Sheikh Hassoun is uh, quite an amazing person. He is one of those passionate people that's always laughing or flaring up about something. Uh, he's very interesting and uh, Bishop Lucas is the opposite, a very calm and well-ordered individual. Um, so uh, the next thing I wanted to talk about a little, and I thought I could see that, but I can't, so I'm sort of wandering through my thing here, um, is civil society. We're always told that there is no civil society in Syria because Syria is a dictatorship. How can they have a developed civil society? Well, that's ridiculous. We met with the uh, Chamber of Industry, which is the same as our Chamber of Commerce. We met with members of uh, the uh, clerical groups. We met with um, the Lawyers Association. Uh, we met with um, all kinds of people who are um, what I would call civil society. We met with NGO workers in uh, two different uh, <coughs> NGOs. Actually, three different ones, but one's controlled by the government. It looks after the families of martyred soldiers. But the other two, again, I'll get to a little further down. Um, so I believe there is a civil society in Syria and that this is part of the great lie that's being promoted about Syria. It's as if somehow Syrian people are barbaric, you know? They're not capable of civil society. They uh, were supporting the most, you know, we're supporting the ones who want to kill other Syrians when there's, one, when there's 17 or 18 million Syrians who uh, are living in peace in their country and have an army that is uh, not necessarily the most malicious army in the world. It's largely uh, conscripts. Uh, since the war began, there's a lot of volunteers, but initially it was conscripts. Uh, and uh, they feel, they believe that they are protecting their country. They believe that they are um, protecting their country from a violent force that will tear it apart. Syria has <coughs> civil defense also, kind of like uh, the uh, volunteer ambulance and kind of like the volunteer ambulance and uh, fire department here. They are trained. They have to go through uh, special training on how to help people, how to, uh, and now that there's a war, they're very busy, and the equipment is degraded and old, and uh, because there's no money in Syria. But they're working hard, uh, and they are contrast. They, uh, they are contrast to the White Helmets, who again, get a lot of attention, who have received huge sums from the West, like 200 million dollars and they work only in occupied and opposition controlled areas whereas the Syrian civil defense is like our civil defense they work in neighborhoods uh, and they're apolitical and they respond to anyone who calls um, so um, the number what was the number one issue presented to us by all the people we met in Syria and uh, it was uh, the sanctions. The sanctions, uh, U.S. sanctions, don't allow Syrians to use the international banking system, essentially. They are closed out of it. The first thing it does is it makes um, the Syrian pound absolutely worthless outside of Syria. And I noticed this during the Iraq war, I was in Iraq and the Iraqi money, you could not change it in Jordan. <laughs> it was totally worthless outside the boundaries of Iraq. And that's how the Syrian money is now. So how is their developed industry going to get the resources they need to function? They cannot pay uh, people who made the machines, for instance, that they use if they're in, uh, many of them are in Europe. They can't, uh, they can't get parts for things that break. They can't get maintenance for their uh, uh, machinery and they can't get uh, supplies. Just, you know, when you build things, you need um, basic supplies to do it. So uh, the factories are already diminished by the wars. 
because many of them have been blown up. Almost the entire Aleppo was the main, oops, excuse me, Aleppo was the main uh, Syrian center of uh, craftsmanship and manufacturing uh, before this war began, and there is nothing left of it. It has all been destroyed. Uh, they, some of the uh, stuff, they actually dismantled and took in big trucks to Syria. And I actually have a video somewhere on my website showing them. Um, again, one of the moderate rebel groups, supported by the United States, <coughs> waving the tractor trailer over the border in one of the checkpoints controlled by al-Nusra, uh, al-Qaeda that is, and um, sending them into Syria with these dismantled, uh, you know, like craftsman factories, type factories from Aleppo. They, uh, in 2012, they took over the main, uh, the main chlorine factory, the main chemical uh, manufacturer in Aleppo. Uh, they can't, so with the sanctions, on top of this, people are unemployed. Unemployment in Syria is through the roof because the factories can't operate, and so they can't employ them. They can't build things. They don't have medical supplies. They can't, uh, they don't have uh, really basic medical supplies because the kind that they manufacture themselves, things like, you know, things for sterile, sterilizing, things for bandages. Uh, they don't have any, they can't get um, any, um, they can't get things for uh, chemotherapy and cancer drugs. They can't get filters for their dialysis machines, so people on dialysis are dying. Uh, they can't get, um, um, there's no way to inoculate the children against diseases. And here they are, where their water supplies and their water purification sources are in many cases being bombed, or blown up by suicide bombers, or car bombs, hospitals. Uh, if you look at the videos when you see pictures of things blown up in Syria, because they don't always go with the dialogue, one of the things I notice is if the roof is blown out, somebody dropped a bomb on it. But if it isn't, it was probably a car bomb. Or it was just fighting on the streets. So you can't, the Im images can be discriminated. Uh, so again, they can't fix things. They can't make cement. Uh, because of these uh, sanctions. So, uh, and in civil society, it also has an effect, the non-existent civil society. Um, the guy at the lawyer syndicate gave us in great detail an explanation about how they were kicked out of the International Bar Association and they no longer have access to international courts. So say they wanted to complain to the ICC, the International Criminal Court, about, say, Turkey allowing all the terrorists to cross their border, <coughs> or about Saudi Arabia and Qatar paying people in Syria to fight the government. They can't do that because their lawyers are not, do not have access to the international court system at all. They can't even go and complain about the fact that they don't have access to the international uh, court system because they don't have access. Um, the universities, their students are now cut out of exchanges. They can't, uh, the students and faculty can't go to conferences, international conferences, where the latest uh, scientific uh, information is being shared. Um, students that were out of the country when the war began can't come back because then they wouldn't be able to leave again. Students are, uh, and there's a big draw from the West, an attempt to take only the um, refugees that meet their uh, idea of what's going on in Syria so that they will tell the story as the mainstream media is telling it. So I think the United States has taken in something like, I don't know, 2,000 or 5,000 uh, Syrian refugees throughout the entire course of the war. And they're blocking aid from going into Syria. So that kind of gives you an idea. And just this week, uh, that story was um, supported by an article in The Intercept. Um, the first paragraph says, International United Nations assessments attained, obtained by The Intercept reveal that the United States and European sanctions are punishing ordinary Syrians and crippling aid work 
during the largest humanitarian emergency since World War II. An internal United Nations email obtained by The Intercept also fought, faults U.S. and EU sanctions for contributing to food shortages and deteriorations in health care. The August email from a key U.N. official warned we, uh, that sanctions had contributed to a doubling in fuel prices in 18 months and a 40% drop in wheat production since 2010, causing the price of wheat flour to soar by 300% and rice by 650%. Mind you, the Syrian government is attempting to feed all the refugees that they have housed within the Syrian government area. Um, the email went on to cite sanctions as a principal factor in the erosion of Syria's health care system. Medicine producing factories that haven't been completely destroyed by the fighting have been forced to close because of sanctions related restrictions on raw materials and foreign currency, the email said. So the United Nations is aware that this is happening. Uh, so the next important thing that I learned, and what I think is perhaps the most important thing that you won't hear anywhere else, is that the Syrian government has a reconciliation plan that is alongside their war making in the region. And um, the Syrian Arab army, unlike the United States and its allies, have a lot of people on the ground. They have members from all over the country. They have people, they have intelligence from inside of all these areas that are controlled by the opposition. So it's not surprising that, even though the United States won't admit it, that when they fight, they uh, do a lot less damage to people, in any case, than uh, the Americans do. It seems like the, every time the Americans go out, they kill another 100 people. But the Syrians and the Russians who are talking to them work, do work with intelligence. And I'm not saying there's no collateral damage, but in many cities and neighborhoods, they have, in many towns, they have made every attempt to evacuate the people before the fighting started, and a lot of lives have been saved that way. And if you'll remember, the Civil War of the United States was the most brutal war ever fought, but uh, Lincoln wasn't blamed. He was later uh, given great credit for the accomplishment of the war, which was freeing the slaves. And in Syria, the people who say they're fighting for freedom are fighting for power. They're fighting for their idea of freedom and power is to control the company and remake it into uh, a different society than the one that's there now. Uh, a more rigid society, not a more open society, a more narrow society. So, um, one of the things that, um, and I seem to have passed it by here, maybe I'll get to it so I won't say anything. Um, so reconciliation, what's the plan? Well, they, it's part of, they, they evacuate as many people as they can from an area. And yes, they do lay siege to it. However, they have um, workers, NGO workers, that go into the area who live there, whose families live there, and work with the local people to uh, form what they call popular committees. And they work with the popular committees to bring resources into the community if it's possible, which it isn't always. And then from there they uh, offer uh, opportunities for reconciliation and amnesty to any Syrian national fighter who wants to lay down their arms and rejoin society. And they ship like from Dereya, they sent 700 uh, men who did not want to stop fighting up to Idlib. They bust them with their families to Idlib. And they also did that uh, when they um, <coughs> cleared some of the neighborhoods in uh, Homs. Now this, I mean, there's a war going on in Syria. There's no doubt. There's violence and hostility on all sides. People are being hurt all over, but they're looking at an end game of people being able to live together again. And um, they are working on uh, finding a way 
to uh, bring people back because, and I think this makes sense, a lot of people who joined uh, the fighting early on, they joined because the mafia took over their neighborhood basically and they had to choose. Am I going to be one of the fighters or am I going to be a victim? They joined because they were threatened or because their children were threatened. They joined uh, because um, it looked exciting, and they wanted to win, and they wanted to be powerful and be the government. And now they see that that's never going to happen. Because, uh, you know, less than 10% of the population uh, is not going to have power over the other 90-some odd percent uh, in an, any natural form, only with somebody like the United States holding the real power. Can that happen? Um, they are, and the reconciliation program, I, I think that it has a real chance. They've, uh, in Homs, it's su succeeded in several neighborhoods, and again, there's, uh, people were very happy. Uh, Eva Bartlett was there, an American, uh, Canadian reporter, and uh, people went home after uh, the neighborhoods were safe to be in, because they weren't safe uh, when they were under the control of the um, opposition forces, who even in our own, even our own government admits are, uh, cannot be separated from the Al-Qaeda groups in Syria, and are so fragmented that they could never form a single unit they are basically neighborhood, uh, <coughs> they're neighborhood groups that are uh, protecting whatever they think is theirs to protect. Criminals join them it because it's a good place for them. It's a wild west. <coughs> and uh, yes, there are a lot of people there who are suffering terribly and in general their suffering is less after uh, the areas uh, accept the amnesty program and are reunited with Syria. And meanwhile, the Syrian government is, uh, the Syrian government is, for instance, providing grain and electricity uh, to the ISIS held city of Raqqa. They uh, provided electricity to uh, all of Aleppo until the United States actually bombed the electrical plant because they said that uh, you know, the Syrian government was supporting uh, the terrorists by keeping it open. And so then nobody, all 1.5 million and people <coughs> in West Aleppo, never had electricity. And they're all using generators and weird mismatches. I saw this in uh, Kurdistan. It's a nightmare. It's like a fire hazard beyond imagination. Uh, and they, uh, the water supply was polluted. Uh, because uh, the people holding uh, East Aleppo were dumping bodies and uh, other trash, just dumping raw trash in, into the river from which the water supply is taken. And the Syrian government was shipping truckloads and truckloads of water there. And it's kind of interesting because one of the things they complained about with this last uh, initiative on, in the war was that it caused the water to be shut off. And they didn't mention that the water shut off in West Aleppo, <laughs> in the government-held area, because uh, al-Nusra took it out. They turned it off because one of their pumps got uh, hit during one of the bombings. And so they made it even. But at the same time, uh, the Syrian government resumed sending truckloads of water to the best of their ability. And uh, But this is a losing battle for them. They cannot support the country under the sanctions, under everything that's happening. They cannot do an adequate job. So far, it's really quite miraculous, there has not been any kind of disease that's run through the population yet. But it will happen if they can't get out from under these sanctions. And the only one in Syria who has any interest in uh, providing that kind of medical, basic medical care to the children of Syria is the Syrian government and uh, the Syrian NGOs that remain in the government <coughs> held area. And uh, we talked to people at one NGO, and it was kind of interesting. We talked to two different groups there. First, we met 
with a, uh, a group of people who uh, were providing training for uh, young female head of households. Uh, most of them, uh, their husbands had either died or disappeared. And to be honest, I don't think they were Syrian soldiers' wives because uh, the soldiers, had, they have a special program, which they showed us, for the families of the soldiers. So they have to be uh, people who uh, were abandoned by their husbands in the fighting, or whose husbands were killed in the fighting on the other side. And uh, they were learning sewing and uh, professional sewing machines. They were uh, very happy with themselves, very happy with their work, and then they, the NGO would help them find jobs after they learned to use the machinery and to uh, do the job, basically. They had literacy training there, a school for the children, uh, and uh, they had like a social training thing, uh, which included personal counseling, uh, for people who've been traumatized and also just, you know, like classes for how does a woman get along in this male-dominated society when she's by herself and how can she protect her children from people who might lure them into prostitution or to selling things on the street and, you know, how does she keep her family together in this context? So <laughs> that was the first place we visited. And then uh, later we visited um, another place uh, where... Uh, the young men who are actually <coughs> interpenetrate the different communities uh, in uh, the reconciliation program are uh, are employed, and essentially these these were angry young guys too. Oh, I said something about naming a group of uh, militants, and they were like, "They have no names. They are the enemy." But what they do do is they go in and they make a connection with the community. They bring, uh, they are allowed, you know, they bring a certain amount of resources, whatever the government can get to them, whatever they can get from the United Nations, and they go into these communities and they make connections with people, and then when they have the people, uh, the connections with the people, they form these popular committees, and then they negotiate basically with the people who are controlling the communities and they start negotiating uh, some kind of an agreement where everybody gets what they need. And um, one of the things that um, Mr. Hadar said was that uh, whenever they do this, there's a huge backlash and a whole bunch of money floods the community uh, from Saudi Arabia or Qatar uh, so that the people won't be interested, basically. Um, and, but then it wears off and what they found is a lot of people, uh, in every case, more people, preferred to stay within the country than to leave. And what, then they have to drive the foreigners out. And that's where the real war happens. And that's why it's so bitter in Aleppo. Because in Aleppo, they're very close to the Turkish border, and there are a very large quantity of foreign fighters there uh, among uh, the people who live there. So uh, it's a very difficult thing. I'm not saying that there's, I don't think anyone's hands are clean in Syria, but I do think that the only chance for the people of the region to recover their agency, their ability to control their own resources, to control their own government, is if they uh, are rejoined with Syria. Um, let's see what I have next year because I'm going off on my own here. Oh, I, I wanted to just create a comparison here. So I said, first of all, uh, what, is, uh, what does reconciliation mean? Well, what does it mean for the West? Uh, what is it that we want to impose on Syria to help the people there? Um, it's a top-down imposed reconciliation. It's negotiated by a lot of foreigners who set the priorities and very few people from within uh, the government-held area where the majority of Syrians live are engaged in this process. Uh, there are uh, people represented in this process, who are there are more people in this process who represent the very small percentage of the population in the opposition-held areas. Um, 
and they are given an equal standing with the democratically elected government of Syria. They just elected a new parliament. It's uh, all different parties and independents are represented there. Um, the uh, resources from outside, there's a siege on the entire country. That's what it means. That's what U.S. sanctions mean. Not a siege on a city or a town where someone can go through and bring something in if they know how. The entire country is under siege and the largest part of the population is being bled. Um, so this is their idea of reconciliation from the Western world. And their end goal is the breakup of the Syrian state. And they've pretty much admitted that, I think. Um, what does the Syrian government mean when they talk about reconciliation? <coughs> well, it's a grassroots process. If it doesn't work at the grassroots, it fails because it's completely dependent on the people of the community. The local population participates in all of the decision making. And in fact, their agency is restored to them by this process because now they have someone backing them instead of just whoever it is controlling their territory, whatever militias control the area where they live. So they have options. Um, quick relief is possible. And um, there's a very slow reintegration of the Syrian state. And they have a motto, and it's reconciliation, not revenge. Because there's a lot of people in Syria who are very angry on both sides. Um, so the next thing I wanted to bring up is some barriers for the U.S. peace movement, because the U.S. peace movement has not been able to wrap its mind around this issue. And it's getting really frightening right now, because the United States is threatening Russia and Syria. And they're doing it, and Russia has just withdrawn from a major nuclear uh, protocol that the United States and Russia agreed on, because the United States was not upholding their end of it. They were cheating. And the United States well said, well, you know, we just muffed the rule, uh, what difference does it make? And Russia said it makes a big difference. Because you're setting aside your nuclear waste and we're destroying ours. And that's what the agreement was, to destroy it. Um, the United States has said it was too expensive to do it right. Um, so this is a very threatening thing. Even if we somehow are restrained from starting World War III with the... Uh, Russians over this situation, the entire Middle East is in turmoil. And U.S. allies are causing most of it. Saudi Arabia and uh, Qatar, Turkey, uh, Kuwait is spending a lot of money on this. And um, people have been upset. I'm not necessarily blaming them, but they're being used as cat's paws by the United States. And they are doing, they are funneling huge amounts of weapons into the region through Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia has bombed Yemen, a country with very, uh, the poorest country in the Middle East, the most uh, non-interested in external things going on in the Middle East, to smithereens with U.S. bombs, U.S. intelligence. That means that if they hit a school or a hospital, the U.S. is the one who targeted it. The, in Syria, same thing. Uh, U.S. allies in the U.S. are indistinguishable because everyone is using U.S. intelligence, which is satellite intelligence, which means that they don't really know what's going on on the ground. Um, so we have uh, the barriers to the U.S. peace movement embracing this awful situation are that, first of all, I think that they have sort of an alien view of the Syrian uh, civilization, the Syrian culture. They think they're so much different from us that maybe they really do want to have a bunch of terrorists running their country. Who knows? Well, no one wants that. You know, um, that maybe they really do want to live in a very narrow society that uh, drives out uh, anyone who's different. But everything I've ever seen about Syria going back well before the war is that that's not true. That Syria is a tolerant country a tolerant people. Um, so uh, I, they think maybe that all Arabs are like fighters, like the Bedouins. No. These are modern, civilized countries. Syria, Iraq, they're modern, civilized countries. Even Qaddafi's Libya 
had a veneer of that modernity and civilization. Unfortunately, he did not have the political roots to hold on to it. But people were living well there. They had running water and electricity everywhere in the country, free schools, hospitals that you could go to and get treatment if something happened to you. Same in Syria. And it's being destroyed right now. Um, and people here have been convinced by the propaganda that Sunni and Shia can't live together. And there is no reason to believe that. <clears throat> everywhere in the Middle East they were living together. Christians and Muslims were living together. Everywhere in the Middle East before we came, Jews and Muslims were living together. In Iraq, in Iran, in Syria, in you know what is now Israel, in Palestine, everywhere. People live together in peace. The wars are a European invention, these nationalist wars and these uh, religious wars. Um, there are some really effective forms of propaganda that have been used. One is the white helmets. Now they want to give them a Nobel Prize. But even Max Blumenthal wrote up the company that's supporting them and that created them uh, on Alternet and said that this is a Western fiction. This is, they have $200 million from the United States and its European supporters in like the last year. God only knows what they do with it because they don't seem to be having, doing anything but making videos. Um, lies about the beginning of the war. At the beginning of the war, it was kind of like in Ukraine. Um, there was an incident, people really were upset. <clears throat> The government attempted to respond. They sent a peace delegation to Dorea. And uh, the people, in response, uh, burned down the police station. And then there were snipers. They sniped police and civilians. People just were getting killed. And um, the government attempted to deal with this and really didn't you know, set out against this. Really, it took them nearly a year to really uh, make a strong response to this. <coughs> and in the meantime, um, there were places like Geezer of Sugar and also in the town of, uh, in, uh, I think it's Bani, in um, Latakia, no, uh, Tartus, I'm sorry, uh, where somebody made a call and asked for the military to come and protect them, and when they arrived, uh, they were massacred by these fighters who were waiting for them. Uh, there was a lot of provocation at the beginning of this. Um, and no one knows who exactly. Um, and the other thing is the demonization of the Syrian leadership. And um, we could start with Bashar Assad. Everybody knows that he's evil, you know. Uh, he is, uh, I've, met him. I didn't think he was. Uh, he talks about having a social market democracy and he talks <coughs> about how why would he want to kill his own people. He tries everything in his power to restore the unity of the country because he wants it to stay tolerant and open and he doesn't want anyone to have to leave or be killed. Uh, but it's more than that. If you look up Ali Haydar, the head of the reconciliation program, you'll find that he's with the Syrian Social Nationalist Party. And they'll say that it's uh, fascist. Well, it's a left party. They have all kinds of socialist things that they do and that they believe in. They do believe in greater Syria. Like, hey, in America, can we judge someone else for being a nationalist? You know, uh, they, uh, greater Syria, as it turns out, includes uh, Lebanon and Palestine. Uh, they have a big branch of the SSNP actually in, in Lebanon. Uh, I don't know about Palestine, it's such a mess right now. But uh, they believe in a secular government and freedom of religion and all this stuff that we really like. So why are they calling them fascists? They're not into a dictator because uh, Mr. Haydar's in the government with people from other parties. And in fact, his name is almost never mentioned. Uh, then the Grand Mufti, they tell these horrible stories about how he was going to, you know, send suicide bombers after his son was killed. He didn't say that. He said, as many people in the Middle East have said, that if you grow a crop of terrorists here, you will not be able to control them 
and they will come after you next. And he was right. It's true. They know it in Paris. They know it in San, San Diego. Uh, all over, you know, it's true. You cannot be like, you know, creating an organization and giving them tons of weapons and funding that is hostile to everything you believe in and expect that you can be their friend or that they're gonna, you're going to be able to control them. So um, here's this wonderful progressive Sunni guy, Sunni cleric, Sunni academic, a scholar, and he's like looked down on. Why? Because they don't want you to know that this is a real, this is like the vast majority of Sunnis in the world are tolerant and open, just like the vast majority of Christians in the world. And uh, that they, they don't hate everybody who's not like them. Uh, Oh, and then there's always Putin. How we love to hate Mr. Putin, but, you know, Russia is allied with Syria. They say U.S. proxies versus Russian proxies. Well, you know what? Saudi Arabia and Qatar and Turkey, they are U.S. proxies. We're driving them. But Russia and Iran are Syrian allies. They, aren't, they didn't start this war. They aren't fighting it to get Syria to do something for them. They're just trying to let Syria survive. And um, in the mess of all this horror of war, it's very hard to keep a clear head around the outside of what's going on and strategically who's doing what. But I think we need to understand that and we need to oppose it because it would be a horrible crime to destroy the state of Syria and even more horrible to start a nuclear war with Russia. And both of those things are on the table right now in our government. And that's a very sad thing. And um, I didn't use my slideshow, and I'm so sorry. I, uh, I have some pictures, which I guess I'll show you. That's in Homs. Uh, I can flip through this quickly. Uh, uh, that is a picture of uh, some guys, uh, some... Um, uh, some ISIS uh, members somewhere. Hmm? This is the woman, this is an American reporter reporting from Aleppo, East Aleppo. Here she is, she's joining Syrian society. Well, this is not Syrian society. That is. That's Syrian society. And that's worth fighting for. So, uh, I have here, oh, there we are with uh, President Assad. Uh, after we met with him. Um, I'm going to open the floor to questions and answer. I want to go back for a minute, though, and just, I have these list of links and also my contact information, and I have, uh, there's a yellow pad back there, and if you want a copy of this list, uh, which is just sort of a, a beginner level one, actually, they're all well-known um, writers to all of us will recognize their names. Unfortunately, they're not Arabs. Uh, but um, they are well-known writers in this country, and, uh, and me, of course. And um, I would love to just put your email address there. I won't bug you about anything, but I will send you the list. And then if you want to be bugged, you can put your name on the white list, and you can join us whenever we want to call people out to say, no, I don't want a war on Syria. No, I won't tolerate having the United States start bombing Syria because it's, it's unacceptable. So that is where we're at right now, and uh, I appreciate your coming, and one of these days I'll actually figure out the slideshow. Thank you. Thank you.